Okay, welcome back everyone. Hope you had a restful uh, break. I didn't, <laughs> but that's the way it goes. Catch up time is a uh, free break for me. Um, you all have the exam, good. Make sure you check it over to make sure there are no mistakes in the greeting or anything. If you do see something you want me to take a look at, bring it to my office and uh, I can certainly look at that. Uh, the average was about 75, so pretty good, actually, um, as things go. Um, I have to say, this is the first time I've taught this class where the average on the second exam is about the same as the first exam. Usually it goes down. So you guys did pretty well. Um, so either my exams are way too easy, or you're actually learning, and that's good. So I like to see that. Uh, okay. Um, well, let's get started. We're moving into chapter seven now, and this is a chapter where, I, actually this is a chapter which is very difficult for students typically because um, of the concepts that really require your three-dimensional skills, because we're talking all about stereochemistry. In a lot of different ways, we're talking about stereochemistry. Um, more than just what we've already talked about. So re recall we've, we've talked about what stereoisomers are up to now. They are different molecules which have the same constitution. That is, they're all, all the same atoms are connected to each other, but they're arranged differently in three dimensions. Okay? And we saw this with cis and trans isomers, either on a double bond or when things were fixed in space um, and there was rotation restricted in a ring. Uh, but there's another kind of stereoisomer uh, that this chapter deals with, and it's actually an important aspect of the three-dimensionality of molecules. Um, and that's because of the fact that they aren't flat, that a carbon in an sp3 hybridization is a tetrahedral. Okay, so that is not flat. It has groups pointed in different directions, and so that each one of those groups are different. What we have is a situation where one molecule uh, can look the same as another and have a lot of identical aspects, except that groups are arranged differently in those three dimensions around that tetrahedron. Okay, and so if you take a look at these two uh, examples with just A, B, C, and D groups on the carbon, um, these are mirror images of each other, but they're not the same. And we'll take a real close look at this um, in this chapter. Uh, and there's um, a term we use to, to refer to these kinds of molecules, and we call them chiral molecules. So this is all about chirality. Chirality means that you have something whose mirror image is not the same. Okay? It's like your hands, right? You have a left hand and a right hand. They're not the same, although they look like mirror images of each other if you hold them up, right? They look identical, but if you hold them like this and try to superimpose them, your thumbs and your fingers don't line up in the right way. So they're not the same. They're different. And that's the same thing with molecules which have mirror image isomers which are not the same. Okay? And this happens when we have four different groups attached. So if you take a look at this, for example, this is a, a carbon molecule, actually dichlorochloromethane. This is a molecule which actually is a symmetric molecule. And if you take a look at this um, mirror image isomer, you can see that they are identical molecules. So here's a, here's a chlorine, and you can see if you were to uh, superimpose these two molecules on top of each other, the chlorines would overlap, the hydrogen here would overlap with that hydrogen. Uh, this fluorine on the left, if you slid this over, would line up with that fluorine, right? And this fluorine would line up with that fluorine if you were to slide it over. Okay, this molecule happens to be symmetric. Its mirror image is identical. It is not, it does not exist as a chiral molecule. It's um, uh, what we would refer to as a chiral. Okay, so notice uh, this molecule, dichlorochloromethane, two of these groups happen to be identical on the molecule. Okay, we have two fluorines that are the same. And so if this one is exactly the same as that, and so that appears here as well. The mirror image is identical for those groups, and we have symmetry in the molecule. Okay, now if you take a look at a molecule with different groups. So if you look at this tetrahedral carbon, I have uh, a red, a purple, a green, green or yellow? Green, I guess, and blue. 
Okay? And if you look at that molecule in the mirror, right, you can see if we reflect everything over, right, the purple is close to the purple, green is close to the green, but going towards the back, the blue is up and the red is pointing out to the left, and the mirror image will be pointing out to the right. Okay? Well, if you, if you rotate that molecule on the right, rotate that, and then think about lining this up, slide it over and superimpose it on top of each other. Right? You see that because it's a three-dimensional tetrahedral structure, those are different molecules. So some of these groups line up. Right? So if I, if I were to slide this over, that blue atom would line up here. The red atom would line up with the red atom. But this green atom would be in the position where the purple one is, and those aren't the same. Okay, can you see that? And then in the back, you have the purple in the back here, and if you were to slide that over, it would line up on top of the green one on the left. So no matter how you rotate this molecule, you can't get them all the same atoms to line up, all the same groups to line up. Okay, so these are not the same molecule. They are isomers. They are stereo isomers, and because they are, they have this Stereogenic carbon, they are referred to as chiral molecules or chirality. There's chirality all over nature, actually. Um, if you think about um, you know, a screw and a screwdriver, you turn it to the right to screw it, screw it in, right? And you turn it to the left to unscrew something. Well, that's a helix, right? That screw is a helix. And it's a helix in a particular direction. If you were to take the mirror image of a screw, it would be a helix in the opposite direction. That's actually a form of chirality. Those, those are not superimposable if you took mirror image screws and tried to uh, overlap them or superimpose them. Okay? And this kind of thing, this kind of thing exists all over um, as examples of this. Um, so let me uh, oops, I went too far. Let me talk about some of the terms we talked about. I've already mentioned some of these. Um, chiral molecules. Chiral molecules are molecules which are not superimposable on their mirror image. Uh, it's a what we refer to that type of isomerism is that they are enantiomers. Okay, enantiomers. That's a term we use to refer to molecules who only differ in that their mirror image is not the same. Uh, there are certainly stereoisomers, which aren't enantiomers. We've talked about cis and trans and things like that, and I'll come back to that. If a molecule has somewhere a plane of symmetry in it, it can't be chiral. So does everyone know what a plane of symmetry is? Symmetry 101? Okay, if you were to take an object or a molecule and, and you have a you can bisect it in a plane somewhere where the left side of that plane is the mirror image of the right side of that plane within the molecule or within the object. That would be a plane of symmetry. Uh, and molecules that have that uh, would not could not be chiral because if there's a mirror image somewhere bisecting the molecule, then it's the mirror image of the whole molecule would have to be the same. Uh, and I'll I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Uh, we saw that with the difluoroplural. Nothing. Um, carbons, we, we actually have a lot of terms to refer to specific carbons in a molecule that have four different groups attached to it. Uh, I like this term stereogenic carbon because that gives rise to the possibility of enantiomeric stereoisomers. Uh, there's lots of ways this is referred to, a chiral center, a chiral carbon, um, chirality center, uh, that's usually referring to the specific a specific carbon in a molecule, which has four distinctly different groups. On it. Okay. So those are some terms you should become familiar with and uh, start to use. Um, does anyone have any questions up to now about these terms in chirality? Well, here are the examples I just showed you uh, a few minutes ago. The, the chiral molecule with four different groups attached, and you can see its mirror image um, is different, as we talked about a minute ago. And the difluoro uh, chloromethane molecule, and this shows actually a plane of symmetry which bisects it. So if you, if you take a look at this molecule where 
this chlorine and hydrogen are coming out towards you. Uh, and the one fluorine is going up and one fluorine is going down towards the back. And you were to take a mirror and slice it right through there, the top half is a reflection of the bottom half, you see? So if you can find a molecule which has this mirror plane of symmetry, uh, then it can't be chiral. It can't exist as an antimer. Um, so, if you look at these molecules on the top, can you see any plane of symmetry where you can bisect the molecule and uh, uh, divide it in half where one side is a reflection of the other? You can't, right? If you were to define a plane, say, here, right, and bisect the molecule this way, um, this would be above the plane. You see, the, you just slice the red, the carbon, and the blue right in half, that's fine, but coming out towards you is a purple and going out away from you is the green. So this purple is not reflected in the back, so that wouldn't be a plane of symmetry, okay? Uh, because they're not the same, the front and back. Here, you can see the plane of symmetry is the same top to bottom, the way that's drawn. And the same thing for this one, you can't find any plane of symmetry there. If you can, you know automatically it's an achiral Molecule, not chiral. Okay, and these show up all over the place. So when we think about molecules which have stereogenic carbons, um, many, many, many molecules involved in life processes in, in biochemistry and biology are inherently chiral because they contain organic molecules which have stereogenic carbons in them. Uh, for example, uh, Glucose, that's a sugar, um, that has a number of stereogenic carbons. Actually, if you take a close look at this glucose molecule, uh, there's one carbon here. That has four different groups attached, right? We have an oxygen, which is attached to more things. We have an OH, we have a hydrogen, and we have a carbon, okay? Each four of those groups are different. So that's one stereogenic carbon. And if actually, if you look at every single carbon in this molecule except one, this carbon, this carbon, this carbon, this carbon, and that carbon, all of those carbons are stereogenic carbons. There happens to be uh, five different stereogenic carbons in that molecule. The only carbon that's not stereogenic is this one back here, right? And you can tell because that one has two groups on it which are the same. There are two hydrogens which are drawn there. So that would be the only carbon here which is not stereogenic. Of course, glucose, sugar is involved in uh, biochemical processes, glucolysis, energy, etc. And so our bodies use this molecule as the, that particular mirror image. The other mirror image we don't use okay, is this mirror image that we use. DNA, not only, now this is just a crude structural representation of DNA, DNA has chirality on many different levels. So the backbone, which is just represented by these, these uh, blue bars here, that's actually made up of sugar molecules called uh, deoxyribose, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. Deoxyribose has stereogenic carbons in it, so they are themselves inherently chiral, and life has a, uh, one particular mirror image of it that it used, the other mirror image is not used. Um, actually, it's interesting because DNA even has a higher order chirality because when you get two DNA strands come together and the base pairs line up, it forms a helix in a particular direction, just like the screw I was talking about. This helix winds in one particular direction, not in the other. Okay, so even the superstructure of DNA is chiral. Same thing with uh, proteins, amino acids are the backbone of proteins. They're simply polymeric chains of these amino acids. This is a, this one of the general structures for amino acids. Um, this carbon here happens to be a stereogenic carbon. And if you start to connect these up into long chains, you can make larger proteins. They themselves also are, are chiral. They have one, um, one mirror image that's used. So nature, has adopted one particular mirror image of these chiral molecules in life processes. And that's important because that uh, affects how molecules interact biochemically and biologically. 
Um, we perceive mirror image molecules in different ways because the receptors, for example, if you think about smell and taste, our smell receptors and taste receptors are made up of proteins which are inherently chiral. And if you have molecules which could exist as mirror image isomers and antimers, such as carbone, carbone has a stereogenic carbon in it, and so if you look at this molecule and you look at its mirror image, they're virtually the same, except that if you were to flip this over and try to superimpose it and line everything up, this group is coming up, and in this one, this group would be going down if you flipped it over and lined it up. Okay. So it's shaped differently in three dimensions. So as we, as that molecule goes into our uh, smell receptors, we smell it differently because it's, it binds in different places on the enzymes which allow us to smell things. So this one in the, well, I'll talk about this in a minute, in the R minus form, this particular mirror image smells like spearmint, and it is the natural product found in spearmint which gives it that distinctive smell. Whereas this one is found in caraway seeds, and we smell that as caraway, okay, or rye bread, um, which is interesting. Uh, limonene, also, one smells like orange, the other smells like lemon or turpentine. That's actually a very close smell, uh, because it's binding in different places in our three-dimensional receptors in, uh, in our uh, olfactory things. Okay, and then if we think about medicines, this is actually critically important. Uh, this happens to be a picture of a protein which is involved in uh, remodeling connective tissues. So in things like um, arthritis, you have collagen in your joints that gets eaten away. Or in cancer, when cancer needs to uh, metastasize, it has to... Uh, it secretes enzymes that basically chew up connective tissue so that it can invade the blood cells and the blood supply and, and migrate. Uh, these enzymes can be halted by small molecules which will bind to it. But if you can see, for example, this molecule docked or bound into that protein to deactivate it, that enzyme. Uh, but there are stereogenic carbons and the shape of the protein also has a very specific three-dimensional structure. So if this stereogenic center or that stereogenic center had the opposite mirror image configuration, so instead of this group coming up, which is right here, that's coming up, if the group was going back, it wouldn't fit. So it would bump into that part of the protein. That molecule wouldn't fit in there anymore. And this is how all of this uh, three-dimensional recognition takes place. This other stereo center also, this is going back. If, if the group were to come up towards us, it would bump into this part of the protein. That molecule wouldn't fit. Okay. So stereochemistry and the three-dimensional structure of molecules fits into biological receptors like a lock and a key. You have to have the right lock and the right three-dimensional key to fit into that three-dimensional lock. Okay. That's how cell signaling happens. That's how a lot of things happen biochemically. Uh, and this is uh, something that was recognized, unfortunately, for, for the wrong reasons, and it was based on this particular drug, thalidomide. Has anyone heard of thalidomide? Thalidomide is actually a drug which is used even now for some cancer treatments and some other things. Uh, but in the late 1950s and early 1960s, it was given to uh, pregnant women as a uh, remedy for morning sickness. So it actually had very beneficial properties as a morning sickness drug, um, but this molecule has a, a stereogenic carbon. And it was sold as a 50-50 mixture of those two enantiomers, those two mirror image isomers. The problem is that the other mirror image of that molecule caused birth defects. And this uh, created a, a whole generation almost of um, babies which were born uh, severely deformed. Um, I don't think this was ever approved for treatment in the US, but uh, in Canada there were a lot of uh, children born with this thalidomide uh, syndrome. Um, so that, actually, that raised awareness that 
in order for drug companies to produce medicines that have stereogenic carbons that are chiral, they have to actually separate the two mirror images, look and examine them, and test their effectiveness and toxicity in the pure mirror image forms before it can be sold as a drug. Okay? The FDA mandated that, uh, I think, in the 1980s. So a lot of what organic chemists do now and the research going on is how to control the three-dimensional structure when we build molecules and synthesize molecules. Um, so, does that bother you, the window? Okay. So we have chiral molecules. We have molecules who are not superposable in their mirror image. Um, and we have to think about, well, what differences do they have in terms of physical properties? Okay. Mirror image or chiral molecules um, actually, for the most part, have identical properties unless they're interacting with something else which is chiral. Like I talked about, molecules fitting into biological receptors. Uh, the receptors are chiral, the molecules are chiral, and so they have to fit right. But if you're just looking at things like boiling point, um, infrared spectroscopy, uh, NMR spectroscopy, um, melting points, things like this, the properties of the two mirror images are exactly identical. There's no way to tell them apart. There's one thing that shows a difference when interacting with chiral molecules of one mirror image or the other. And that is how they interact with, with uh, light beams which have been plane polarized. So plane polarized light, this was something which was discovered in the 17th century by a Dutch uh, scientist. What he found was that if you take light and you pass that beam of light through a grating with very, very tiny slits in one direction, what you got out was light which was polarized in a specific direction. Okay? So light is made up of both wavelength properties and particle properties, right? I hope you all know that from physics. Uh, and as a light beam travels, that wave of the light is actually going out in all three dimensions from that beam of light. So if a wave is, is um, alternating this way, and you pass it through a slit, a uh, grating filter like this, a polarizing filter, only the beams of light which are, have the wave traveling and resonating in the direction of those slits pass through, everything else is blocked. Okay, so that's what we call plain polarized light. All the light is aligned in a single uh, direction of, that, of those waves. Okay, it's like uh, polarizing sunglasses work this way. <laughs> They help to block a lot of the light because they're blocking out um, light, which is traveling in waves in alternate uh, directions. So what was observed? Well, this, 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 he's responsible for discovering plane polarized light. Uh, but it was not until the uh, 19th century, early 19th century, in 1815, that Jean-Baptiste Biot discovered that this light affected organic molecules. Okay, and affected means the molecule changed the orientation of the light. So what happens if you, if you were to look, if they, you have this beam of light which is traveling in one wave and it's traveling towards you and you can see that it's traveling in this direction, the, the, it's alternating in this direction in the wave, and it passes through a solution of a chiral molecule, what happens is that light gets rotated. So, Polarized light, if you have a sample of a molecule dissolved in something, which is a chiral molecule, that light passes through it, and when it comes out the other side, that wave is tilted one way or the other. Okay? That depends on the mirror image or the chirality of the molecule, which way it turns. That's, that's the only real observable physical property that we can see from mirror image molecules. So it's quite interesting. Um, the story, actually, I like to tell stories. So the story of how we really started thinking about organic molecule structure in three dimensions is quite interesting. Uh, this is uh, in the 18th century, in 1769, Carl Wilhelm Scheele discovered 
tartaric acid. Tartaric acid is, is quite famous because it's produced in winemaking and in France and in Europe, of course, wine was very important. And so you can see if you look inside a barrel that's held wine or you sometimes open up a wine cork, you see these crystals that are formed on the cork of the wine. Uh, that's, a, that's a salt of tartaric acid, which is this molecule. Tartaric acid has four carbons, two carboxylic acid functional groups, and two alcohol functional groups on it. Uh, you might know that salt, by the way, that potassium salt is uh, sold as cream of tartar. It's used in cooking because I guess if you have all this leftover after winding, you've got to do something with it, so use it in cooking. Um, Anyway, this, this molecule has two stereogenic carbons in it. This carbon in the middle has four different groups attached, the hydrogen that's not drawn here, and this, this, and this. And this carbon also is a stereogenic carbon. So that's a chiral molecule. Or it could, has the potential to be a chiral molecule. Okay? And uh, a little while later, Louis Pasteur actually discovered that this tartrate, or these tartrate salts, affected or rotated plain polarized wine. Actually, what we have present in wine is a 50-50 mixture of the two enantiomers. So he actually separated them um, and made some interesting observations. I will say this picture is actually, uh, I took this picture in Paris uh, in Louis Pasteur's laboratories where his original samples are still being held there. It's a fascinating place. Um, but he, he's the same Louis Pasteur who's responsible for pasteurization, um, and he's done a lot of different, uh, has a lot of different contributions in terms of science. Um, and if you read his papers, he talks about his discovery. Quite interesting. He, what he observed when he looked very closely at these crystals of these uh, tartrate salts is that they were not symmetric crystals. And he found that they were crystals, the crystals themselves were mirror image crystals. So even, not, even on a macroscopic scale, not on a, a molecular scale, but on a macroscopic scale, the mirror image isomers of these molecules are being reflected in that they crystallize into separate salts. One salt is a mirror image of the other. And he saw that some of these incline sometimes to the right, and some of these incline sometimes to the left, and so he very painstakingly under a, a magnifying glass or microscope uh, manually separated these mirror image crystals. There's a lot of work to do that. And then he took these separated crystals and dissolved them in, in a solution and passed plain polarized light through it. And he saw that the, the separated crystals, um, once he made a solution of them, rotated that plain polarized light in one direction or the other, depending on which pile he took those, which mirror image pile he took those from. So he showed that tartrates were chiral. Now, remember, this is in the 19th century. This is the 1800s. We barely have an idea about atomic structure at this time. We don't know much about molecular structure. Uh, and there's nothing known about the tetrahedral nature of carbon. So they don't know as much as we do now about all of this. Um, that rotation of plain polarized light uh, we, we have to somehow standardize this because what that property actually is is as the light passes through a solution, each molecule it interacts with rotates that light just a little bit more. So as it goes through, it depends on how many molecules it hits, how far it rotates after it comes out. And so what we've done is we've standardized this. Um, we refer to this as the optical activity of chiral molecules. It's a specific property of a molecule. Uh, and we refer to this as the uh, standard rotation, which is symbolized by this. This D, you might see this notation. The D is referring to the light which is used in a polarimeter or plane polarized light. It's a specific, the D line of the sodium um, light. When you burn sodium, you get a specific light at a wavelength. At 589 nanometers, that's the sodium D line. Um, and so that's the one that's used as a standard for all uh, polarized uh, light rotation experiments. 
Um, and then we have to account for the fact that each sample is going to be different, right? Different amounts, different sizes. And so if you take the rotation you observe and simply divide it by the length of the cell the light passes through in the concentration, that standardizes the, quote, number of molecules it hits as it goes through, right? So the standard rotation, then, is what's reported. So when you see molecules which are chiral listed, you see they have a standard rotation that's a specific property of that particular molecule of that particular enantiomer of the molecule. So we refer to that as optical activity. Um, optical activity depends, of course, on being a very pure sample. Okay, so what's observed in this property of rotating plane polarized light is that one enantiomer of the molecule rotates the light in one direction, the other enantiomer rotates the light in the opposite direction. Okay? The mirror image molecules rotate them in opposite directions. So if you have a 50-50 mixture of the mirror image molecules um, and the light passes through it, for every molecule that rotates it to the left, another molecule is going to rotate it to the right. So guess what happens once it comes out the end of the sample cell? If it's a 50-50 mixture, it shows no rotation, right? Because they cancel out. Uh, and that's a special case which, which we refer to as a, a racemic mixture. A racemic mixture. And Louis Pasteur observed this. So he wasn't content with just separating these piles of crystals and measuring the rotation of polarized light. He then took those crystals in equal amounts and mixed them together and made a solution and found that there was no rotation of the light, exactly for this reason. Okay. So if it's a 50-50 mixture, it'll show no optical activity, or it means that polarized light won't be rotated. In fact, it's being rotated, but in both directions equally, so it comes out and looks like it's not being rotated. What would you think if you have a mixture which is, say, 75 25? 75 of one mirror image and 25% of another mirror image. Will the light be rotated coming out the end of the sample cell? Yes. Will it be rotated as much as if you had a pure sample? No. Okay, so this is actually a technique we can use to gauge how pure something is in terms of its enantiomeric ratio. Because if we have a pure sample, and we know it rotates a light and has a specific rotation of, say, uh, 20 degrees, and then we um, can take a mixture, a sample, and we measure that it only rotates a light 10 degrees, we can actually calculate what percentage of the rotation would be due to um, one enantiomer versus the other. Uh, so it's a useful measure of the purity of a sample as well. And has been used that way for a long time. Well, this is another interesting story um, uh, of science. So when we really think about this idea or our concept of chiral carbons or asymmetric carbons, uh, we didn't really know at this time uh, that carbon was a tetrahedral, okay? Um, there was a, a man named Jacob Van Hoff, who was a, a, a young scientist who was very interested in um, this idea of stereoisomers. He was trying to envision what the structure of carbon was with groups on it. And so he actually made this observation. Uh, Joseph Lebel was another chemist uh, that was uh, working with him, and he had other collaborators as well, a man named Herman. Um, in 1874, they actually proposed that carbon was a tetrahedral. That's the first time that anyone proposed carbon was a tetrahedral. Uh, again, without much idea about bonding and structure at this point. And he says that uh, they may exist as a pair of isomers if they have four different groups attached. So this was the first inkling that this property that people were observing of uh, rotating plane polarized light, while at the same time these molecules have identical other physical properties, was due to this asymmetric carbon. 
Um, and what you see in science, and if you really go back and read the exchanges that take place between scientists, right? Uh, let me digress for a moment. Everyone understands what the scientific method is, right? We answer questions based on observation and reporting those. We make a hypothesis about why, how something works, and then we test that hypothesis, and that hypothesis is either proven true or not, right? Um, and we write about it. And so we scientists will then publish their findings in a scientific journal or some other way to disseminate that information. And then other scientists will criticize it and they'll tear it apart. Um, and that's how science is fortified because what we have are scientists all tearing each other apart. So what comes out actually is our best idea about the knowledge that's possible. Um, and uh, that happened back then too. And I love this. Uh, a uh, paper by a, a very well-established German chemist, Hermann Kolbe. Um, he, after he saw that work by Van Hoff, he published this criticism of it, which is really an interesting read. I'll just, I, I know you can't read this from here. Uh, but Van Hoff and, and uh, another person he published with, Hermann, were very young chemists. And of course, when you have the old established uh, scientists they're not going to believe everything the young chemists say. And so he wrote this, and you can see some of the things that he talks about here. Uh, I've recently published an article giving as one of the reasons for the contemporary decline of chemical research in Germany, the lack of well-rounded and thorough chemical education. And so he's, he's complaining about the education level of the people who made this claim about an asymmetric carbon. Um, as a consequence of chemistry professors laboring with problems, um, there's an overgrowth of the weed of seemingly learned and ingenious, but in reality trivial and stupefying natural philosophy. So apparently he doesn't believe anything that Hoff said. Uh, what else does he say? Uh, I love this line. Uh, this natural philosophy, which has been put aside by exact science, is at present being dragged out by pseudoscientists from the junk room, which harbors such failings of the human mind, and is dressed up in modern fashion and rouged freshly like a whore when one tries to smuggle into good society where she does not belong. So basically he's saying that these ideas they're putting out, you know, they're not worthy of being, even being talked about, let alone published in a scientific journal talking about this article by Van Hoff. And he even goes on to talk about how he thinks Van Hoff, who is actually at a veterinary school, was uh, dreaming and riding on his Parnassus with these crazy ideas about asymmetric carbons and didn't believe a word of it. Good read. Uh, anyway, what's interesting is that the old established chemist wasn't right. Van Hoff actually received the first Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1901. Um, so his ideas were actually confirmed by others in the field who took a close look at what his findings showed. Um, and Colby, well, he was just an old scientist over the hill, I guess. So interesting story. The literature is filled with these kinds of exchanges. And that's what science is, actually. It's a, it's a dialogue. Okay, I make a, a claim. I support that with evidence. Hopefully, other people try to recreate it. If they can support it, if they don't believe it, they'll criticize it. Um, they should have evidence to criticize it, though. If they don't, then they will get proven wrong. So, interesting side light there. Um, okay. Well, this fact that stereogenic carbons <coughs> exist as stereoisomers when you have these centers of chirality or these stereogenic centers in them means we have to have a way of naming them differently. Okay, if they're different molecules, then we have to somehow distinguish them differently. And so you see here, 2-chlorobutane uh, uh, can exist as two mirror images, and the name is exactly the same except for this superscript, uh, this uh, prefix here, which is S in this case, and R in this case. Okay, so just like we had for double bonds, we had cis and trans, or maybe better was E and Z for the orientation of the groups around the double bond, um, or cis and trans on a ring. We have a way to distinguish one enantiomer from another using a systematic naming system. And fortunately, some of this you already learned. So uh, 
what we do is, is if we have a single stereogenic carbon, we identify the four different groups attached according to a priority. And where else have we seen priorities? In E and Z, right? So we have this systematic way to buy atomic number uh, to identify the highest priority group on either side of the double bond. Those con ingold prelog rules for our priorities that we use for E and Z are the exact same rules we use for identifying groups on a serogenic carbon. Uh, and there's a little more to it, though, to figure out which one would be S, referring to sinister or left, uh, Latin for, for left, or R, referring to uh, Latin for right, for rectus. And so you can see here I've labeled these 1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, based on the highest priority group being number one, I will caution you though, some books do this differently. Some books switch those numbers around, so don't be confused by that. What I mean, what I mean by highest priority is one is the highest priority. So if you look at this carbon, okay, that's the stereogenic carbon. Uh, we have four groups attached. The highest priority is a chlorine, okay, uh, by atomic number, just like in E and Z. The lowest priority group is a hydrogen, okay, so that's four. And the other two groups on here are carbons. And so what we have to do, just like we did for E and Z, we have to assign the priorities first at that first atom and then go out until we can make a difference, right? So this is a carbon with three hydrogens on it. This is a carbon with two hydrogens and then one other carbon. So the, the group I've labeled two is the second highest priority and the CH3 is the third highest priority. Okay, and the way you do this, the way you assign S or R, is the direction of going from the highest priority to the third highest. So one, two, three, going in that direction, but pointing the lowest priority group away from you. And that's the important thing. So the way I've drawn this, I've shown the hydrogen going to the back. And if the hydrogen is going to the back or the lowest priority group is going to the back, it's easy. You just uh, go, in this case, you go counterclockwise or to the left. Then we say the configuration of that stereogenic carbon is S. Okay? So the same thing here. Now, uh, I flip this in the mirror image. One, two, and three, the lowest priority group is going to the back. And you have to go clockwise around the circle to go from one to two to three. And if you go clockwise or to the right, we would configure that as the R configuration. Okay, it's, it's not that difficult, except that you have to be really good at visualizing and orienting these molecules in your head. Um, otherwise, it's very easy to make a mistake. Uh, if the hydrogen is pointing away from you, or coming out towards you, it's easiest because then you can just take, well, if they're pointing away, it's just the direction. If it's coming towards you, you just look at that direction and take the opposite. Okay? So you don't actually have to visualize coming from behind and looking at it. You just take the opposite. It's a little more difficult if the hydrogen or the lowest priority group is within the plane. So you notice whenever we draw a stereogenic carbon, two groups are in the plane of the board. One is coming out and one is going away. That's usually how we represent a tetrahedral. Okay? There's a, another good uh, rule of thumb uh, for doing this, uh, which makes it a little bit easier, and that is using your thumb. Using your thumb and your fist. And so the idea is you have a left hand and you have a right hand. Okay? And all you have to do is point your thumb in the direction of the molecule of the lowest priority group. So, for example, this molecule, if the hydrogen is going to the back, I point my thumb to the back, okay? And then my hand curls in the direction of one, two, three, that's what it is, right hand or left hand. In this case, for the molecule on left, it's going the wrong way, right? You have to actually go over here, point your thumb in the back, and then your hand curls in the right direction, that's your left hand. That tells you it must be an S for sinister or left. Okay. If you try to do this one with your left hand, you go chlorine one to three to two, it doesn't work. You have to use your right hand. So it does help. 
Um, and it doesn't matter if the hydrogen is pointing up, you point your thumb up and do it. Okay? If the hydrogen is pointing to the left, you point your thumb to the left or to the right, point your thumb to the right and do it. So it's a little bit easier, I think, to use this sort of trick. Um, remember, your thumb is always the lowest part of the group, and your hand then curves in the direction of the other three groups in the priority from highest to lowest. Okay. So let's take a look at some examples. Uh, this is a molecule, actually this is a, an important molecule in biology, that long chain actually embeds into the cell walls and that attaches on different sugar groups on the surface of cells. It's very important for cell recognition. Uh, but this molecule actually has two stereogenic carbons on it. There's uh, one where the oxygen is attached and one where that nitrogen is attached. Um, so if I look at this a little more closely, we should be able to use our priority rules and assign the configurations for each of these groups, right? And, yet, and this actually, this molecule has two stereogenic carbons, so we have to assign each one of them an R or an S configuration. So let's take a look at this one, the first one with the nitrogen attached, this carbon, okay? What's not shown there? The hydrogen. The hydrogen is pointing in which direction? It has to be coming up because these two bonds are in the plane of the board. The bond to the nitrogen is going to the back. So the hydrogen, which isn't written, I'll just draw it here, is coming up towards us. Okay. So now let's assign the priorities. Lowest priority, if there is a hydrogen, it's usually hydrogen. Well, that would be the lowest of anything, so it has to be hydrogen. Hydrogen has to be four. What's, uh, what's nitrogen? One. Okay. And then we have two carbons. Here's a carbon, and here's a carbon. Which has the higher priority group? This one has to be priority two, and this one has to be priority three. Okay. This one on the left is a carbon attached to two hydrogens and an oxygen. The carbon on the right, one hydrogen, one carbon, and an oxygen. So it has one higher group on it. So that is the priority. So what's the configuration then for the carbon that the nitrogen is attached to? So if you go one to two to three, it's clockwise to the right, but the hydrogen is pointing up. So you take the opposite. Okay, so that must be the S configuration. Right, and if you do that, if you use your hand, your thumb is points up, you go from nitrogen to carbon to carbon uh, in the direction that you need your left hand to do. Okay, so that first one is S. How about the second one? Hydrogen is going down, away from us, okay? Oxygen will be the highest priority. Okay, what's the next highest priority? Yes, it's going to be the carbon attached to the nitrogen. So these are both carbons. This is a, this is a let me just draw it here, C, H, N, C, okay. This one, remember, the double bond counts twice. So this carbon is a C, a bond to an H, and a C, and a C. So the nitrogen wins out. So that has to be two, and this has to be three. The whole group is three. And so it's clockwise with the hydrogen going to the back. Right hand to do that is the R computer. Okay? So this molecule then has um, S configuration at that carbon, R configuration at that carbon, and in the name, although this is a little bit more complicated, we would use those associated with the one S, I'm sorry, this would be like, uh, 2S, 3R. Right. Okay, we're going to practice some more of this on Wednesday, um, and uh, we'll get some more examples.